And I'm really very grateful to Marion and Kim for inviting me to speak at this first of the four research network sessions. And I think this is going to be an extremely valuable, original, thought-provoking series of workshops. I'm also looking forward very much to the uh, programme of films uh, this, this afternoon or this evening as well. And um, in approaching the particular theme of this session, that of the relationship between film and the performing arts, I'm very keen to um, try to open up a dialogue as widely as possible in order to focus on some of the preoccupations of today's workshop. For example, how exactly film and moving image forms work to transform performance when they intersect with it and vice versa. How film works to mediate, reframe the experience and the time of live performance events notably through the incorporation of moving image elements into the space of performance and through particular forms of projection and audience perception and also how ideas of intermediality can be traced specifically through this intersection of film and performance. And because, as Kim was saying, a particular emphasis of this workshop is on experimental avant-garde forms of moving image culture in their relation to performance, I thought I would try to explore how that particular phenomenon of the, of the experimental in film, if it is indeed a, a phenomenon, can usefully be understood right across moving image history. And so for that reason I thought I would look at three separate examples that I've been researching in recent years that extend across the entire history of film in its intersections with performance. So this presentation will begin with a focus in 1895, the year of the very first celluloid-based film projections for public paying audiences. And look at the projections in Berlin of the Slavnovsky brothers, Max and Emil, who showed their, their own films in November 1895 at the ballroom of the Central Hotel in Berlin, several weeks before the Lumiere brothers' projections in Paris in the following month. And crucially, these films were all films of performances projected in a performance venue and shown spatially directly alongside acts of performance. So I guess I'd like to suggest that there's an intimacy, a complicity between film and the performing arts that extends right through from film's origins and is formulated at the start as being an experimental conjunction, both in its technological and also its aesthetic dimensions, among others. And uh, in the second part of the presentation, I'm going to look at a more familiar era of avant-garde and experimental moving image culture, the 1960s and early 70s, specifically at the performances of the dancer uh, Tatsumi Hijikata, uh, originator of the Buto choreographic form in Japan, particularly in relation to the tensions or collisions that can emerge in film's relationship to performing arts, especially when a performer is opposed to or ambivalent about having their performance filmed. And in the final part of the presentation, I'm, I'll move on to the contemporary moment and look at the projects of the internationally renowned Lebanese performance artist and filmmaker, Rabia Mrue, who has been experimenting with this volatile intersection between performance and film. And I'll especially be looking at his recent performance works, such as The Pixelated Revolution, which analyzes the very dangerous filming via iPhones by citizens in Syria of government army snipers who had been trained to shoot and kill whoever they saw with a film camera or a handheld moving image device. So in a sense, what I'm hoping to do over the next 30 minutes or so is to present a very brief survey across the expanse of film history of how the idea of the experimental could be understood precisely within the intersection between film and the performing arts, and also to explore how closely film and the performing arts have been entangled in many ways, extending far beyond the domain of film acting to the extent that this intersection of film and performance could be seen as a special entity in its own right, even an amalgam with very particular dynamics and also with demands for its spectators and its audiences. And before I start with the uh, experiments of the Slavnovsky brothers, I just wanted to say a word or two about the range of approaches, uh, critical theoretical frameworks, methodologies, that could be adopted in looking at the relationship between film and performance, and at film and the other arts in general. So perhaps these will come up across uh, uh, the, the four workshops. And I think part of the focus of this research network will be to investigate such approaches, which could well be almost infinite in their amplitude and take many different configurations in each particular instance, since they necessarily concern areas of conjunction, intersection, 
interstices, interzones between media that will invariably shift and mutate according to the ways in which their space and time are perceived and according to the endurance across future time of that intersection or else its rapid vanishing. And since film itself now forms an entity whose parameters are themselves increasingly uncertain and have been at least since the prevalence of digital image making, then the starting point of knowing exactly what film is in its relationship to performance is also a valid focus for exploration. And film's own origins in sequential photography, as in the 1870s, 80s experiments, uh, photographic work of Edward Muybridge, is arguably as pivotal a moment, I, I would suggest, as film's contemporary absorption into digital image culture. I think it's always interesting to look right across film's history with all of its tangents, repetitions, its aberrations, in order to have a perspective on film's specific rapport with performance. So uh, I'm just going to look very briefly at two of the approaches or themes which Marion and Kim had mentioned as focal points of this workshop. Firstly, that of the time and the, the time of film and performance, and also the particular spaces, particularly urban space, in which film and the performing arts intersect. Often, film is seen as the medium which documents performance and thereby securely holds for future time the moment in which an ephemeral performance took place before lapsing. In that sense, film would be the medium possessing the more durable grip on time itself. Often when a performance hasn't been filmed, such as many of the events of the 1960s and 70s, avant-garde arts and theatre, someone will ask, why wasn't it documented? As though it then holds only a tenuous and temporary survival in the memories of its witnesses or participants. A filmic document may only last for a split second, as with the film of the 1971 performance by Chris Burden, Shoot, in which the artist is shot and wounded in an art gallery space. Or a film document may unfold over hours, as with Andy Warhol's films. A, film, a filmic document may be shot in extreme proximity to the performer's bodies, as, for example, with the film shot by the filmmaker Kurt Krenn. Of... Okay. It's Krenn. <laughs> so Kurt, Kurt Krenn, the performance actions of the Vienna Actionists of the 1960s. Or it may be documented at a distance, or even from overhead, as, for example, with the filmed performance undertaken by the American artist Robert Smithson on the completion in 1970 of his work Spiral Jetty, in which he himself ran at speed around the entire course of the, the, uh, um, the, the rock work, the, uh, the spiral in the Utah Great Salt Lake, while his action was filmed from above by a cinematographer in a circling helicopter. In that era, Robert Smithson conceived of cinemas to be built in caves in which only films of performances would be projected. And in all of these instances, the sense of documentation may be linked to the sense of immediacy, corporeality, intimacy, movement and gesture, which is ostensibly salvaged by film from the performance before it elapses, or at exactly the very same moment that it vanishes. What then characteristically follows is that films of performance accumulate and eventually become stored in archives through which the originating performance can somehow be revivified from the material of film each time that a, a visitor or, or a researcher to the archive watches the, the document. But uh, what I'd like to ask is if that is actually a misconception that film dependably documents performance and, and then holds it safe for future time. In her book, De Death 24 Times a Second, the film theorist Laura Mulvey emphasizes the quality of mortality that film always carries, and which it infiltrates into everything it comes into contact with. Film archives can themselves decay and disintegrate, either via neglect or through film's various material fragilities, which may extend also to those of digitized film documents of performance. Many prominent filmmakers of performance, such as Kurt Krenn, have envisaged the purpose of their work as being not that of documenting performance, but conversely of allowing film to recreate performance as something entirely new and allied solely with film itself. So it could be that performance rather than film is actually the medium that may hold a more tangible durational dimension and that the respective times of film and performance may even become antithetical ones. <coughs> 
And such approaches to film's reframing of live events also have their implications for space. In a sense, film and performance converge spatially right at the moment of film's origins in the 1890s and 1900s, when the spaces assigned to performing arts and to the projection of films were identical ones, as in the example of the Sladnowski brothers' projections, which I'll talk about in a moment. Perhaps some of the most useful material spaces in which to explore the many conjunctions of film and performance are those auditoria which were conceived as environments for spectators to experience film and performance with as great a degree of spatial and temporal coincidence as possible. Spaces that are often now abandoned ones, as with the many film theatres of the Broadway Avenue of Los Angeles. With the interiors of now obsolete architectural environments of conjoined film and performance, what remains are distinctive urban spaces in which film and performance can often be resuscitated, as for example in the contemporary use of such abandoned auditoria in Los Angeles for experimental arts events. And some of the most demanding environments for the filming of performance have always been those undertaken in open air urban spaces, often those in states of transformation rather than in theatres or other indoor venues. In exploring spatial approaches to the intersection of film and performance, it's perhaps often the case that the presence and the volatility of distinctive urban environments serve to generate pivotal frameworks for intermedial investigation. So, for the first part of this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about the relation of film to performance in the work of the Sladnowski brothers in mid-1890s Berlin, and especially the dynamics of experimentation in their work. And in many ways, celluloid-based film really began with the compulsion to record performance. But that pre preoccupation with recording moving image sequences of performance possessed many precedents. And perhaps the, the greatest inspirational figure for filmmakers active in the mid-1890s had been Edward Muybridge, who undertook many projection tours in Europe and the USA, showing his moving image sequences recorded on glass discs and projected with his hand-built projector, the Zoopraxiscope. And many of Muybridge's own sequences showed performances in the forms of dances, actions, and gestures which he had choreographed and recorded himself during his work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and other sites across the previous two decades. Muybridge's projection events also had a performative dimension of their own, since he usually stood directly alongside his projection screen and gave a three-hour animated running commentary on his sequences. Moybridge had visited Berlin in 1891 and shown his sequences at an event attended by the Slavnovsky brothers. But in 1893, Moybridge himself had suddenly abandoned all of his work after building an expensive auditorium at the Chicago World's Fair, the so-called Columbian Exposition, in which to project his moving image sequences of performance movements in what was effectively the world's first purpose-built cinema, arguably. And he experienced a great financial disaster that effectively ended his career. But that same year, 1893, celluloid film became widely available for the first time. And so at that moment, it was an experimental medium whose possibilities strongly appealed to innovators in moving images, such as the Sladnowski brothers, who came from a background in performance, especially of magic performance, and were looking for innovative ways to attract new audiences. So there's perhaps a very formative, determining moment at that, at that point in the lineage of film's relationship with the performing arts, when figures who had previously been engaged in other activities or occupations, for example as mag magicians or as conjurers, um, then decided to become filmmakers, and specifically filmmakers of performance. And in the summer of 1895, the Slavnovsky brothers decided that the subject matter of their ongoing experiments in filmmaking and film projection would be acts of performance, which they would film in open-air environments at the height of summer so that they could have the maximum natural light for the performance to be recorded on celluloid film stock. The particular reason why they chose to film performances rather than another subject matter relates to their expected audience. At that time, in the mid-1890s, Berlin had extraordinarily avid audiences for all kinds of innovative or novel performers who arrived in Berlin from every part of the world and performed across many different kinds of venues. 
So the Slavnovsky brothers made a series of very short films of the performers who were attracting most attention in Berlin at that moment, midsummer 1895. Dancers, especially from Italy and other countries, also jugglers and acrobats. Although they were able to shoot films of only a few seconds in duration, they could then construct film loops so that each sequence was repeated a number of times, thereby extending the films to a duration of an entire minute or more. So their program of films lasted for around 15 minutes in total, with uh, uh, perhaps uh, 12 or 14 films shown altogether. And after undertaking some test screenings in a local cafe, the Slavnowski brothers were able to secure an engagement to show their films in one of the most prominent performance venues in Berlin, the Wintergarten Hall of the Central Hotel, alongside the Friedrichstrasse railway station. Here is a photograph just a few years earlier. They were contracted to project their films on most evenings of November 1895, starting on the first of the month, with the projections forming the final part of a three-hour program, which would otherwise consist solely of live performances of one kind or another. And the audience of the Wintergarten was partly composed of the hotel's guests, the, ho uh, the guests of the Central Hotel, from many countries deeply engaged with new forms of popular entertainment. By contrast, when Edward Weybridge had projected his moving image sequences on glass discs in Berlin four years previously, it had been in a scientific lecture hall, the Urania Center, which still exists in Berlin, and for an audience partly of anatomists, scholars, and inventors. And the spatial configuration of the hall, the Wintergarten, was arranged around several stages, with the audience seated around circular tables in front of each stage. So it's a different configuration from that with rows of seating, which emerged in the following decade, once cinema architecture first came into existence and buildings began to be constructed worldwide solely for the viewing of film. And by the time the Slavnowski brothers' films were projected, at the end of the evening, onto a screen placed on a side stage, the audience had already been watching live performances for two and three quarter hours. As a result, the audience must have perceived the films as being subject to distinctive separations in time and space. Firstly, some of the audience would perhaps have recognized the filmed performances as holding those same figures they had witnessed in a live form in the summer of that same year, four months earlier. Secondly, they would perhaps have perceived the films almost as a strange residue of the live performances which they had only just been watching for the previous two hours or so, with the live performances now, in a sense, visually transmutated into this startling but also spectral form. And newspaper reviews of the Slavnovsky projections emphasized that element of spectrality while also highlighting the technological experimentation achieved by the Slavnovsky brothers. Uh, but the reviewers were actually far more, far more interested in the performing element, elephants in the evening's uh, pro programs. <laughs> Mr. Thompson and his three elephants there, so that they actually attracted most of the re reviewers' attention, uh, rather than Europe's first ever celluloid film projections. <laughs> and in terms of space, the films were projected at an interval from the venues main space at the periphery of the auditorium, suggesting perhaps that the venue's managers saw the projections as possessing an experimental tentative status that warranted them being confined to the very end of the program when many of the audience had already left the venue. In order to be able to film and to publicly project performances, the Slavnowski brothers had to invent and construct their own film cameras and film projectors in the same way that other inventors and innovators of film in that era in the preceding years, such as Louis Le Prince in Leeds, the Lumiere brothers in Lyon, and William Dixon in New Jersey also had to do. Although it was often possible to steal ideas from competitors, the special problem of that era was always that of projecting film. And the Slavnovsky brothers had to entirely invent their own projector, which they called the bioscope, using two separate reels of celluloid that were fed alternately through the projector gates. Projection posed great dangers, both of conflagration and malfunction. So, in a sense, projection itself was a performative act that needed to be achieved without any technological malfunction in order to conjure up the spectacle of film and of the performances it contained. In 1893, two years before their public projections, the Wintergarten, 
the Slavnovsky brothers had shot a test film, a test film in direct sunlight on the roof of a building in Berlin's Prenzlauer district, with the Berlin cityscape in the background. By that time, they had built a film camera and had some newly available celluloid film, but hadn't yet devised their Bioscop projector. So one brother filmed the other brother performing a kind of clumsy dance, lifting his arms and legs into the air. And this film was too rudimentary to be shown as part of the so-called professional projections of two years later, and for many years it was believed lost. So it appeared to belong to a distinctive subcategory of films of performance, that is, the lost films of performance, when a performance has been filmed but the footage has either been destroyed, forgotten about, or simply discarded. However, in this case, a few original frames of, this, of the film reappeared in recent years in the local archives of Berlin's Prenzlauer district. In choosing to film performance, the Sklavnovsky brothers <coughs> certainly drew on their own experience as performers themselves and also as directors or entrepreneurs of performance. In fact, the proprietors of the Wintergarten hired them for an engagement of two months, with the first month consisting of these film projections, and then the second month taking the form of a performance in which the brothers staged a spectacular sea battle on one of the stages in the Wintergarten involving great tanks of water. And the filming of performance proved to be a one-off phenomenon for the Slavnovsky brothers, since the demands of the audiences for film were moving so fast that they almost immediately had to find another subject matter. They were also being rapidly surpassed technologically by their competitors, such as Lumia brothers. So they chose instead to film the subject matter of cities. And in 1896, shot many films of the great plazas and avenues of Berlin, such as the Alexanderplatz, as well as cities such as Copenhagen and the German port city of Stettin, where they shot a city film one afternoon, developed it, and then projected it to the audience on the evening of the same day. But their career very abruptly ended when the brothers fell out over a family inheritance in 1897, and their films of performance were rarely seen until they were eventually reassembled for a centenary screening at the Berlin Film Festival in 19, at the Berlin Film Festival in 1995. So, experimentation at this intersection between film and performance can take many forms that are driven by such imperatives as audiences' demands, technological possibilities, social and political upheavals, and film status as an art form. And I'd like to move on now to briefly look at the juncture of film and performance in the, era, in the era which is perhaps most closely associated with experimentation oscillating between film and performance, often of a volatile and even confrontational character, the 1960s and early 70s. So I'd like to focus for a moment on some research I've been doing recently on Japanese experimental film, especially the work of filmmakers who documented the internationally known choreographic form and Koko Buto, the dance of utter darkness, and especially the performances of its principal figure, the dancer and choreographer Tatsumi Hijikata, during that period of time. And these works range from film documents that were never projected in that era and so had no audience at all, and therefore have a lost status, <coughs> to experimental films which were commissioned to be projected at a large scale public event in, in Japan. For example, at the Osaka World Expo of 1970, and were viewed by many millions of spectators there. So I've been conducting interviews with a number of the filmmakers involved in filming, performance art, and dance in that era, such as the filmmaker Takahiko Imura, who made a number of films with Hijikata in the mid-1960s, in which Imura stood on the stage with his film camera and actively collided with and impeded Hijikata and his group of Buto dancers to instigate a kind of direct confrontation between film and performance. And Imira calls this approach by the name cine dance, which he defines in this way. One example of expanded cinema is the experimental combining of film and performance to arrive at a film performance. I was creating cine dance, a rare combination of media and dance. Often, periods of social, political, and ecological turmoil can precipitate an especially distinctive relationship between film and performance, as well as between film and the other arts more widely. 
And in that context, the 1960s in Japan is a particularly tumultuous era in which social tensions endured across the decade, marked by particular moments in time. The beginning of the decade, 1960, with the ratification of Japan's security treaty with the USA, which was widely perceived by opponents as subjugating Japan to the political and cultural power of the USA. And then at the end of the decade, 1970, when the treaty was ratified once again at a time of violent opposition by student groups to the ongoing war in Vietnam, which was being supplied from American air bases in Japan. Fast orchestrated battles took place in the avenues of Tokyo in 1968 and 1969 between student militants and riot police battalions. The French writer and dramatist Jean Genet took part in one especially intensive riot in December 1969, confronting and taunting the riot police as though he were their superior officer in the act of inspecting them. And many participants clearly perceived the, the protests as having performative dimensions of a particular kind. For example, the riots were, were, were very widely filmed with newly available mobile Super 8 cameras, which had a special role also in the filming of that era's performances. Many archives of such riot footage have survived, especially because just in the last few years it has become possible to digitize vintage Super 8 footage to, to a high level. And such footage shows the proximity between performance and rioting, with the same groups engaged in performance art actions or happenings and conducting charges against riot police squads. The conjunction between film and performance art or dance habitually involves a certain degree of collaboration and complicity <coughs> between filmmaker and performer, in which the performer actively agrees to a film document or a film experiment being made of the performance. For example, to serve as future archival or promotional material, or else as an experiment across art forms, intermedial art forms, that emerges from a mutually agreed commitment. Performances across many contexts have been created solely in order to be filmed. But in a number of prominent instances, as with many of the performances of Tatsumi Hijikata, no such joint commitment existed. So the filmmaking of performance was done in an atmosphere of tension and resistance. And this was also the case with other bodies of performance work, which are primarily remembered via the medium of film, such as that of the Vienna Actionists in the 1960s, in which disputes between the filmmakers, Kurt Krenn and Anne Schmidt, and the performers, such as Günther Bruss and Otto Muir, often led to violent disagreements of the ways in which the films were shot and edited. So with the work of Tatsumi Hijikata in Tokyo, his opposition to the filming of his performances emerged primarily from a distrust of representation, which drew from his readings of um, the theorist Antonin Artaud's final performance work of the 1940s, or his notes about, about, about these performances, in which representation of any kind by film, by radio microphones, or any media served to dissipate, to annul the originating distinctive corporeal charge of the performance. In addition, Hijikata had the misfortune to contend with particularly combative filmmakers, such as Takahiko Imura, whose aim was to overrule his choreography via film. So Hijikata only rarely agreed to having his performances filmed and actively preferred to have them filmed in the form of brief fragments rather than complete documents. And only two films exist of complete performances of his work. Hijikata responded positively to only one film that was made of his performance work, this uh, Super 8 film of fragments of his 1968 <coughs> performance entitled Revolt of the Anatomy or Revolt of the Flesh in which it's almost impossible to have any coherent sense of what is happening. Hichikata himself staged a number of filmic performances in his dance studio in Tokyo, in which he would manually pick up the heavy 8mm film projector while it was already in the process of projecting the film reel of his Revolt of the Anatomy performance, and then dance with the projector cradled in his arms, so that his own figure captured in the film was projected onto the studio walls and ceiling in erratic ways, becoming, for example, elongated or distorted still further. Many film documents of performances of that era are silent films, but Hijikata improvised a soundtrack to those uh, uh, filmic performances, if you can call them those, filmic performances in his studio, 
playing either Abbey Road by the Beatles at uh, high volume, or else the recorded cries and screams of Antonin Artaud from his final record, radio recording of 1948, this project uh, for Anthony Erebeck and Jugement de Dieu to have done with the judgment of God. The audiences for films of performance, especially performance art or dance, have often been small and specialized ones, at least until the first large-scale historical exhibitions of performance art took place. For example, the exhibition that was curated by Paul Schimmel at the Museum of Modern Art in Los Angeles and other venues in 1998, this exhibition uh, titled Art of Actions, which uh, some people here may, may have seen, uh, which also traveled to some other cities, and which accorded special prominence to the documentation and res residues of performance art, film above all. Perhaps as a result, films of performance and dance have achieved greater visibility and attention, especially in art museum spaces in the past 20 years, more or less. But in the 1960s and 70s, films of performance art and dance rarely had such prominence. The films made by Kurt Krenn of the Vienna Actionist performances, for example, were mostly shown in the small cellar spaces and galleries, the small galleries in which the performances themselves were undertaken. In this context, the film of Tatsumi Hijikata's performance work that was commissioned to be shown at the Osaka World Expo in 1970, is a, a, a film uh, titled The Birth, had something of an exceptional status as a film of performance viewed by many millions of spectators. So this event, the Osaka Expo 70, was intended to consolidate Japan's cultural and technological reputation and so this entire subsidy of um, pavilions and uh, construction, architectural constructions with um, experimental, experimental designs was constructed on the edge of the city of Osaka. The expo organizers actively wanted to include all of Japan's most notorious performance artists in order for the event to carry an air of cutting edge innovation. And this necessarily led to disputes, since many Japanese performers simply refused to be co-opted in that way, uh, they co-opted financially, largely. And so they attacked those who did agree to participate. However, Tatsumi Hijikata, for reasons perhaps of contrariness, was one of those who did agree for his work to be filmed, and travelled to the northern Japanese island of Hokkaido in June 1969 to be filmed performing, performing a dance work on the edge of a volcanic fissure. The film was shot in an extremely large, unusual format of 70 millimeter film stock, whereas most performance films of that era were shot in eight millimeter or 16 millimeter stock. And at the Osaka Expo, the film was then projected on the upper levels of one of the immense pavilions that was called the Midori Cam, on a 360 degree screen using an experimental projection technology known as Astorama, which was only ever used on that one occasion, <laughs> and involved five projectors simultaneously projecting the footage of Hijikata's performance. The Osaka Expo was a huge success, and it's estimated that 15 million people visited the pavilion, so, so not the, the, the entire expo, which I think was visited by about 60 million people, but this uh, Midori Cam, the, the one where the Hijikata film was, was, uh, was being projected, over a period of six months from March to September 1970, and perhaps that's the greatest exposure for a film of performance in terms of audience numbers. But films of performance have always been acutely vulnerable to obsolescence, abandonment and disintegration. And the film which had attracted such an immense number of spectators immediately lapsed into oblivion as soon as the Osaka Expo ended. Almost all of the vast Expo site was then rapidly razed or dismantled and the film of Hijikata's performance was only rediscovered 40 years later in a storage warehouse. So it now forms part of an archive of his work at an arts university in Tokyo. Now the last of the performance films of Hijikata's work that I'd like to focus on uh, just for a moment is that made of his final performance at an auditorium at Kyoto University in 1973 before he began a 13 year, year period of seclusion which ended with his death in 1986. So this performance entitled Summer Storm which um, perhaps we'll watch uh, an extract from at the end um, this was shot by three Kyoto University students with Super 8 cameras 
who position themselves spatially at the front, in the middle, and at the rear of the auditorium, and then shot their footage with the intention of editing the three strands of their footage together. And it's clear from the results that they suffered technical problems, so that much of the performance actually wasn't filmed at all, and other parts were shot in very dark conditions. And in this instance, instance it appears that the three students simply didn't ask Hijikata's permission for the filming to take place. So he was probably unaware that his performance was being filmed. And as a result, perhaps this film belongs to a further category of performance films in which the performer is neither engaged nor reluctant, but instead is oblivious or unaware to the performance being filmed, which must now, I think, be the most widespread contemporary form of film performance, in which performances are often covertly recorded on iPhones or other digital devices. And the footage shot by the three Kyoto University students in 1973 was never edited together nor projected in that era. And again, there was an extensive interval of void time before it was rediscovered in 2003, 30 years later, in a deteriorated state when the Tokyo-based avant-garde film collective known as Image Forum assembled and edited the footage and issued it on a DVD, this DVD in the, in the Japanese avant-garde dance collection. And such films are now the principal residue or trace of Hijikata's performance work internationally. Many emerging choreographers and performance artists in Japan know Hijikata's work only through its filmic record. And what I find especially intriguing in researching this body of experimental films of Hijikata's performances is how much they reveal about the often contrary intentions of performance filmmaking, its multiplicitous strategies and its forms, and also how acutely vulnerable the medium of performance film has been and perhaps now remains to these imperatives of time and space. Uh, so, I've, uh, the, just the last bit of this talk now. Uh, so, I've spoken a little bit so far about digital image making in relation to performance, and I'd like to devote the last few minutes of this presentation to the contemporary work of the Lebanese performance artist uh, Rabia Merue, whose work examines this conjunction of digital moving images and performances in conditions of acute urban crisis and warfare while also maintaining a close sense of the historical role of filmmaking in the documentation of performance. Um, so I'm hoping to make a few concluding points about the intersection between film and performance within the shifting dynamics of its contemporary context via a brief look at Rabia Mrue's work and its preoccupations. Mrue's performances have been staged uh, principally in art museums worldwide over the past few years and are often undertaken with him simply sitting at a table with an iMac alongside a large projection screen, vocally analyzing the sequences or images he is projecting in the form of what he calls a performance lecture. And so his status as a performer perhaps resonates in some way with the image I showed earlier from 1893 of Edward Muybridge positioned directly alongside his projection screen, vocally analyzing his projected sequences. And uh, Rabia Mrue is both a filmmaker and a performer. So the films that document his performances, such as The Pixelated Revolution, and also some of the filmic sequences, which form integral elements of such performances, are assigned as being his own work. In that sense, the dual status of filmmaker and performer could comprise an identical, simultaneous one that has become amalgamated and perhaps cannot now be disentangled. In Rabia Mrue's case, it relies on his own capacity to interrogate media images, which stems from his personal history as an animator of digital sequences for a Lebanese television channel, alongside his parallel history as an actor in experimental companies in Beirut. So perhaps one of the intriguing aspects of his work in terms of the distinctive intersection of film and performance in the contemporary context with its fluid parameters is that his work transits across a range of media and investigates the uncertain spaces between them. And uh, Rabbi Amrue's principal concern in his recent performance work is with the role of the film camera and its operator in a condition of conflict. From the Civil War in Lebanon, in which he himself fought as a young teenager in the early 1980s, and in which members of his family were killed or injured, to the ongoing Civil War in Syria. And his performance titled The Pixelated Revolution concerns a particular moment in the 
Syrian civil war, now already several years in the past, perhaps an obsolete moment, during which Meruet collected numerous sequences from YouTube and other websites which showed protesters in Syrian cities attempting to film government regime army snipers with their iPhones from the balconies of their apartment buildings or from other spaces as the snipers attempted to remain hidden. So this element of his performance work incorporates what is effectively found footage, found footage which he simply took from YouTube and other, other sources, films which existed on the internet for a certain time and then abruptly disappeared, were taken down or otherwise could, not, could no longer be located. And in a number of those films, the person filming the sniper with an iPhone continues to track that figure for an extended duration, but then invariably the sniper notices that he has been filmed and an eye-to-eye -eye confrontation ensues between the filmer and the sniper. As Mure emphasizes in his commentary, the Syrian protesters are filming their own deaths. For Mure, the people filming appear still to possess a split-second opportunity to drop their iPhones and escape from the sniper's line of fire, but they do not because of the compulsion to keep on filming. So the protesters hesitate for a split second and are then shot and fall to the ground, dropping their iPhones, which continue to film, and they are heard crying out that they have been wounded. The status of the film footage which Murray collected for the, these performances, the pixelated revolution, could never be verified with absolute certainty. Although it's evident that thousands of protesters in Syrian cities were being killed by snipers at that moment, this is about 2012, he notes that it's impossible to determine that the sequences posted on YouTube and other sites are very definitely authentic documents. There is always an outside possibility that the documents are fabricated and have, in that sense, been performed. As a result of this narrow margin of uncertainty, this capacity for a so-called betrayal, which Murray believes that film always possesses, he then made a kind of postscript or coda to the pixelated revolution. This is a film entitled Shooting Images, in which he stages what he calls a reenactment of the kind of sequences he had included in the pixelated revolution. So in Shooting Images, two of Mrue's collaborators in Lebanon performed the roles of the sniper and the iPhone filming protester. Uh, perhaps we'll watch uh, an extract from this, from, this, uh, from this film in a minute. So in that film, Mrue examines the intersection between performance and film in the context of their dual transformations by contemporary urban warfare involving what he calls a war on images. And he also investigates the implications of technologies, of digital technologies of image making, which enhance the instantaneity of the confrontation between film and performance, between the human eye and the camera's eye. Although Rabia Mure's work has a contemporary focus, it is bound up with preoccupations with the history and even the prehistory of film and its performative dimensions. For example, the experiments of the French scientist Etienne Jules Marais in the 1880s. Marais' attempt to construct, or, or actually successful attempt to construct, a so called photographic gun, which would seize moving image sequences of the flight of birds. Also, uh, Rabbi Amrue is interested in the 1870s optography experiments of the German scientist Wilhelm Kühner and others to investigate whether it was possible to discover on the retina of a murdered person's eye the image of the killer's face, this idea that um, the, the, the image of the, the killer is imprinted on, uh, on the, the, uh, the retina of the, the dead person, which also appears in many films, also fiction films. And in Murray's work, um, uh, he also engages with Jean-Luc Godard's use of shot reverse shot filming techniques. And equally, that work draws from the history of performance, notably works which deal with subjugation and the reversal or overturning of power formations. So just to conclude this, this presentation, from having a series of research conversations or dialogues with Rabbi Amrué in recent months, I'm keenly aware that the intersection between film and performance is now undergoing new transmutations in terms of digital technologies, contemporary subject matters such as engulfing civil and urban conflicts, new ways of defining what would be experimental or avant-garde, avant 
and also through new forms, new amalgams perhaps of their respective roles of filmmaker and performer. So th those are just some thoughts about ongoing research projects that I guess are at different stages of, of evolution and that all relate to this kind of uh, intersection of film and performance. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for listening. <laughs>